you are all well witches. Complete disclosure, I ended up getting really overwhelmed with the topic for this week's podcast and I was trying to get it all into one podcast episode but realised it was way too much. Also, it was really complicated. Some of the information I got into, I thought my head was going to explode. I felt that if I felt like that, it might be way too much for one episode. I just got a bit confused. I'm not now. I had to map it all out. I looked like that meme of that guy looking really crazed with a cigarette in his hand and all the photos on the walls and the red string like mapping everything out. That was me. So what I've done is split this episode or split this topic up into two podcast episodes. So we're going to be looking at the deity Ellen of the Ways as follows and certainly lots of different offshoots of her and goddesses that she is supposed to be linked to and so on. So this gets into a really deep rabbit hole. On today's episode, we are going to look at the origins of the female deer goddess in relation to some possible origins of her name, the nature of how and why she would have been so revered, but also a look at the deer itself. So the deer as a power animal, how to work with the deer's energy, what deers symbolize spiritually. We also look at the antlers and how people have worked with them shamanically in witchcraft and so on. So today's episode relates more to the Norse, the Sami, a little on the Celtic front and in respect of the deer we also look at some Native American Indian beliefs also and then the next episode will link to more of her Welsh Irish mythology, different association with different deities stories behind that, how you might want to work with her. There's also an initiation if you do want to work with her too. So without further ado, our book review today is The Crow Folk, written by Mark Stay, which has been on my Goodreads list for a little while. And I was so chuffed to find it in my library, loving the libraries. Honestly, I've like found so many amazing books, especially witchcraft non-fiction books. You'll be so surprised if you just put in witch or witchcraft. I was stunned at how many like real bangers are on there. (laughs) So it's really worth giving your library a look if you haven't yet. I'm telling you now, I'm pretty sure, okay, I'm not going to say everywhere in the world because I appreciate that witchcraft is a sore subject in some parts of the world. But here in the UK, I've been very surprised, impressed by how many non-fiction and fiction witchy books have been available for me to take out of the library. Anyway, coming back to this book, this book, The Crow Folk, is giving major end of summer autumn feels. Perfect time to read this. I mean, there's even a character in it called Pumpkinhead. And let's not even mention the book's fiery orange cover. It's really given like pumpkin themes. Anyway, here is the book's blurb. War rages in Europe, but in a quiet village in rural Kent, there is another battle to be won. Faye Bright has always known she was different, but when she discovers her late mother's diary, she realises why. Full of spells, incantations, runes and recitations, it is a witch's notebook. And Faye has inherited her mother's abilities. 
just in time too, the crow folk are coming and they want that book. Led by the charismatic pumpkin head, their strange magic threatens Faye and the villagers. Armed with little more than her mum's words, the grudging help of two bickering witches and some aggressive church bell ringing, Faye will find herself on the front lines of a war with demonic forces. I loved this book so much, but the first reason why it just genuinely reminded me of listening to my family speak, because on one side of my family, they originated from Bow in East London, and the other side, Bermondsey in South London, before half of my family moved out to like the very outskirts of South London, which used to be called Kent, but is now considered South London still. Anyway, I've never read a book where people say the same things that my family say. It's such a mixture of Cockney and Estuary English. It just had me thinking of my nan and grandparents, to be honest. Of course, they would have been around in this era anyway. I just felt like it was people speaking my language. I've never read a book that has like some of the sayings that I'm used to, that I grew up around. It was so much nostalgia for me. I'm sad to report that I tend to put on my best BBC English when I record the podcast, which can you imagine? But if you catch me talking normally, like my accent is a lot stronger. Anyway, without me being a negative Nancy, not about this book, but it was nice to read a witchy fiction book that was just fun. I've read so many fictional witchcraft books of late that have all pretty much involved the witch hunts, witch trials and the like. And although they are seriously important aspects that, you know, need to be put out there, I just wanted a light-hearted read, a light-hearted read topped off with some mild peril at the hands of a demonic <laughs> crazed pumpkin head and his cronies, a group of scarecrows that have magically been brought to life. Actually quite crazily eerie and scary in places, but overall just a great story for adults who need some escapism. The characters are amazing. Faye, our lead character, is brilliant. She's funny, headstrong. You really can connect with her, as you can all the characters in this book, which is where I think a lot of authors can fall short. I loved one of the other witches called Mrs. Teach. So one of the paragraphs about her life absolutely got me howling. So I really wanted to read it out to you. When Ernie Teach was alive, he returned from the garage every day at six on the dot. And Mrs. Teach always had a hot tin bath ready for him to scrub himself clean. They had tea together, listened to the wireless. It's That Man Again was Ernie's favourite show. And then he would see to his jigsaw and she to her cross stitch. At 10 o'clock, they retired to bed and made love with such rampant enthusiasm that even Mrs Nesbitt next door complained about the noise and she was as deaf as a post. The next morning, Mrs Teach always had to explain to Mrs Nesbitt over the garden fence <laughs> that the banging was caused by air trapped in the plumbing. And Ernie would always get the giggles, make his excuses and step inside. Oh, I just, there were so many books, bits in the book that were like that. It just had me howling. So Faye and her dad run the local pub. Her dad is not into anything magical, shuts everything down with Faye. Anytime she brings up her mother, you know, trying to get to know more about who she was, if she was a witch. However, he is absolutely hilarious. He gave me real pa Larkin vibes from the program, The Larkins. Some of this book really did make me think of that program as from what I can tell, it is set around a similar sort of area in Kent, which is like 
Canterbury, Maidstone. There are so many characters in this book I think you will love. This is a great book to read if you just want to connect with your inner child and have some witchy escapism in the countryside as summer turns into autumn. Highly recommend this book. I think you can tell by how excited I've got to, you know, to talk about it. And cannot wait to see if the library has the second book in the series. Join me after the break to talk all about the dear goddess. Welcome back. So we're first off going to have a look at Ellen of the Ways. She has a multitude of different names and associations across the course of time. However, little is known of her. She seems to have escaped the history books. She is often depicted as an antlered woman or in the form of a deer, sometimes as a source of light. Ellen of the Hosts is a name she was given in ancient Britain. We will look at that on the next podcast episode. However, she has lived on in tradition as Ellen of the Ways. Some believe she could have been a real woman who existed, a real boy, a real woman who existed around the 4th century. However, in British, Welsh and Celtic mythology, she goes back even further. Considered a protector of the pathways, whether they are physical, mental or spiritual paths, she ruled the paths and trackways that cross both nature and the human soul. She is guardian of all who journey and she has been considered a patron saint of travellers before St Christopher was ever given the title, a guardian of all who journey. Her influence on Wales is evident through the sheer number of roads in existence marked with ancient stones that bear her name. On present day maps, San Ellen is clearly posted and San Ellen is the name for a network of nearly 2,000 year old and some much older roads that linked Roman fortifications across Wales and the Welsh word San is said to mean causeway. So yes, it was said that Ellen was said to be responsible for the building of these roads, which in ancient Britain connected strongholds. And some of these roads are connected with ley lines also. Ellen of the Ways is probably the most ancient female goddess dating back to Paleolithic Stone Age era. The Paleolithic and Mesolithic, so Midstone Age era, was a period where deer were highly important to the tribes. They were relied on as a source of food. Their skin was used for clothing, bones for creating tools and weapons. Nothing went to waste from the deer at all. They would follow herds of deer as they made the seasonal migration to where their food was more plentiful. So people would spiritually connect to them as deities. They were incredibly sacred. So overall, it's only male deer that have antlers other than reindeer. So it is said that Ellen of the Ways is originally connected to the reindeer. With most deer, yes, it's only the stags that have antlers. However, in March or April, the antlers of male reindeer begin to grow. It's around May or June for female reindeer. 
the male reindeer lose their antlers at the end of the rutting season in late autumn, whereas the females keep theirs until they calf in the spring, which is why some say that Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, could be a female deer. Anyway, they both grow new antlers each year and each year they grow bigger. It is actually the oldest female reindeer who leads the herd. So this could be why we have a deer goddess. This nurturing creatrix mother has been known in locations across the Arctic regions of Siberia. In countries such as China to Finland, Lapland, Sweden, Norway, Greenland, Iceland, across the boreal forest into the British Isles and even in North and South America. There are still tribes who follow the reindeer as they migrate to this day. For example, some of the Sami people still live this way. And the deer mother is revered as the source of life, death and rebirth by those who live closely with the reindeer. The reindeer are said to know within their bones the ancient tracks that lead them across the land from pasture to pasture according to the seasons. People followed where they walked. They were not herded as we do with cattle. The earliest traces of deer cults are found in the Magdalenian period 14,000 years ago. So the Sami people are said to see the reindeer goddess as linked to their sun goddess. I could not find the pronunciation for this, but it was Gijanit, G-E-I-J-E-N hyphen N-E-I-T-E, who was said to have come to the earth to remind the people of the need to revere the reindeer and to teach them how to care for their beloved animals. Another account I came across referenced the Sami sun goddess as Bevi or Bieji, mother to all creatures and associated with the reindeer. And there is a widespread image linked to this goddess. And it is that of a spark of light between antlers, which is a promise of the returning sun. So at the end of the last ice age, Britain formed the northwest corner of an icy continent. Warming climates exposed a vast continental shelf for humans to inhabit, known as Doggerland, and it made it possible to walk from Norway across what is now Denmark to the eastern side of Britain. I'm feeling incredibly David Attenborough about now without half the brain cells. <laughs> And here we have, it's more than feasible for our ancestors to have crossed the expanse of Doggerland as the ice melted and exposed more hospitable living conditions. I feel like I'm about to do a David Attenborough talking about polar bears or something. Anyway, bringing with them their reverence for the herds and maybe even parts of their language. In the northern original Sami dialect, apparently a reindeer herd is called Ellen. So this could possibly be where Ellen of the Ways originated from. There have been archaeological finds at Star Car in North Yorkshire. This is a Mesolithic site that clearly shows the connection with people and deer during this time. And this really indicates the animistic and shamanic views of our ancestors and how important the deer was to them from a spiritual perspective. The site of Star Car is said to be one of the most important archaeological digs within the UK. It dates back as far as 9000 BC, which is the Mesolithic Mid-Stone Age period. 
So at Starcar, some of the finds included 21 antler frontlets, and this is an artifact that would have been used by humans for corporeal transformation of the human body into that of a deer. So coming back to the reindeer, here in the UK, we last had them roaming wildly around 8,000 years ago. However, they have been reintroduced into parts of Scotland. Can you imagine the UK when we had like bears, wild boar, just blows, wolves, like that just blows my mind. Can we just go back? Our ancestors would have followed the deer as they migrated in order to hunt and the deer would follow the same tracks left by their own ancestors year upon year, century after century. So if a hunter had knowledge of the tracks, they would be at a distinct advantage. The reindeer goddess presided over these migrations and their pathways and this is likely where the of the ways part of her name originates. Ellen of the ways has some links to the astral pathways. Some consider her guardian of the astral trackways or ley lines. So in Scandinavia, the reindeer has a weird association with shamanic journeying because in the area, there are regions where the fly agaric mushrooms grow, which are known for their hallucinogenic properties. However, they are toxic to humans, yet strangely not to reindeer. Randomly, someone discovered that if they drank the urine of the reindeers that had eaten fly agaric mushrooms, the urine only contained the hallucinogens, but not the toxins. So shamans would drink this before embarking on journeying. Deer themselves, not just reindeer, are often associated with the edges of woods and forests, liminal spaces, and deer also tend to be seen around liminal times, such as dawn and dusk, adding to this symbolism with them. And I think it's really important for us to look at the deer in depth to understand overall how they were regarded and considered spiritually. So the deer is said to link to the elements earth and fire, links to the sun. Crystals that are linked to the deer are sodalite, rose quartz, rhodochrosite, unikite and agate. Deities, Canonus, Artemis, Diana, Dal, Hearn, Fenmacul, Freya or Frey, which is a Norse god, Phladeus, Kaliak, Athena, Adonis, Apollo, Gwydion, and Heracles. Magical association linked to the deer are wisdom, abundance, success, peace, potential, spirituality. They are highly sensitive, gentle, determined, vigilance, intuitive, virility, innocence, intuition charm, humility, analytical, energetic, loyal, full of life, enchantment, connecting with your inner child, generosity, vibrancy, harmony and creativity. So as we've been discussing, the deer has long been revered through ancient cultures across the globe with stories throughout Celtic, Norse, Native American, Indian mythology. Practically every part of the globe has tales of the deer and deities that it links to. The deer appears in many Celtic mythological stories. One tale is of the female red deer named Eile in Gaelic, who would free men of the earth from their worldly desires and bring them to the kingdom of the Fae. The deer has long been associated with the fairy realm. Deer would also be in stories where they would shapeshift into women to avoid being hunted. They believed the female deer or hind had the ability to connect to the fairy realm and possess the ability to draw us into our own magical power and spirituality. The Celts also considered the stag as the king of the forest, protecting all other creatures. 
the God of the forest that guides those who enter it, who possess a desire to learn the mysteries of the natural kingdom. The Celts believed that should a man kill a white or piebald deer, he would suffer an untimely death. The deer is considered by many Wiccans as holding several aspects of the horned god. The antlers of the deer are said to spiritually symbolise the god's fertility. The Native American tribes of North America considered the deer as a powerful messenger. A Cherokee legend explains the deer acquired its antlers following beating the rabbit in a race. Folklore also mentions the Lakota deer, a deer woman. So to men, women and children who are respectful of other women and children, she represents fertility and love. She was said to help women to conceive. However, to those who are harmful to women and children, she is vengeful and murderous. She was said to lure men who were unfaithful to their deaths. She would appear as a beautiful woman with the feet of a deer. If she didn't lure them to their death, she would drive them insane with a desire for her. Some stories describe the sighting of deer women as a sign of personal transformation or as a warning. Deer women is said to be fond of dancing and will sometimes join a communal dance unnoticed, leaving only when the drum beating ceases. To the Lakota people, deer woman is called Anakite, the daughter of the first man and first woman. She was originally called Ait, meaning face. Tate, meaning wind, fell in love with Ait and they ended up marrying an Ait birthed quadruplets who were the four winds. Their father, Tate's desire, was to become a god, so he enlisted the help of the trickster spider Inktomy, who made it so the son would fall in love with his wife Ait. To celebrate, Ait was made to sit in the place of the moon, the sun's original wife's spot. The sky punished Ait for this disrespect and cast Ait down from heaven to the earth before making half her face ugly and changing her name to Anakite, meaning double-faced woman. It is said Anakite appears in dreams and visions as a deer or two deer women, a white-tailed deer and a black-tailed deer. The contrast represent appropriate and inappropriate sexual relations. Those men who have sex with her are said to be driven to insanity, whereas should women see her in visions or dream of her, they will gain either strong sexual prowess, powers or creative artistic abilities should they make the right choice in the near future. Here we see the deer in a form of succubi, a demon who can take on the female form to have sexual intercourse with men whilst they are asleep. And it is said that frequent contact with a succubi is said to lead to a man's failing health and even death in the long term. In Norse mythology, the buck were highly regarded creatures, particularly as they relate to the Vikings, for they believed in Ichthania. I can't find the pronunciation for this. But anyway, Ichthania was a kingly stag written of in the Norse prose Edda that stood upon Valhalla with bounteous dew dripping from his antlers. They also considered the red deer as a symbol of spiritual healing and that it had otherworldly connections. In Greek mythology, the deer is associated with Artemis, goddess of the forest and hunting. One myth of Artemis is that she asked Zeus, her father, if she could remain a virgin to run freely through the forest. In the story, she turns Acteon into a stag. However, he is then devoured by his own hounds after he witnesses Artemis bathing in the nude. 
In another story of Artemis, she has a giant doe named the Serenian Hind that has a set of golden antlers like a stag along with hooves of bronze or brass and a dappled hide that was said to excel in swiftness of foot and snorted fire. The deer has been symbolic of divinity dating back to 2000 BC in Europe. In Christianity, the deer is considered symbolic of piety and devotion. One legend is of St Eustace, a Roman general who, whilst hunting in the woods, came across a majestic deer that had eyes that reflected the light of Christ. He claimed to have heard the voice of God through them that advised him he should become a Catholic Christian. During the Middle Ages, the stag became a metaphor of Christ, a protector of people from snakes. So to put things into context, when they say the snakes, I'm assuming that that is a reference to pagans being referred to as snakes. So the deer is said to be symbolic of lessons such as the ability to listen, to show grace and appreciation for the balance of beauty, the power of gratitude and the need to understand what is necessary for our survival. Deer can also point to our ability to sacrifice the self for the higher good when called for. Deer is said to represent love, empathy, balance, camouflage, attention and attentiveness. They demonstrate a leadership through their gentleness which makes this majestic creature an animal that is held sacred and connects to the woodland gods and goddesses. The deer reminds us to rely on all our senses to navigate through life safely, to pace ourselves whilst transitioning through new life adventures. As a spirit animal, they represent the power to face challenges with a calm mind, to move through life and obstacles with grace. They have the ability to escape from tricky situations unharmed. Should they show up as your spirit animal, they can signify you are down to earth, a good decision maker, sweet natured, analytical, able to handle difficult situations and people, but also practical, and that you are not one to flaunt your material possessions or success. You may find that you are often on the run, have an abundant energy, continuously seeking better opportunities to reach your goals. You tend to keep a keen eye on your surroundings and you spend time building trust with new people. You opt for peace and quiet within your environment wherever possible. The deer can remind us in its swiftness of how quickly the moment can pass, a reminder to enjoy every minute we encounter upon our spiritual journey. The deer making a noted appearance in your life can signify a time where you have experienced aggressive, negative circumstances and there is a need to seek out safe, nurturing people and situations to trust your gut instinct when it comes to who is around you. The deer can also symbolise you are on the precipice of an exciting new adventure that will take you down many different paths and lead to important insights. Deer teaches us to stand in our strength, reminding us we are far more powerful than we think. Also that there is a power in being gentle to yourself, Stop pushing so hard and allow life to be. A reminder to apply gentleness into your life and to those around you, that if you can find a place of serenity within yourself and your environment, it will help you listen to your guidance within. Dear reminds you to trust your abilities, but also faith within the universe. Call upon dear energy to help you navigate tricky situations gracefully to help you evaluate your circumstances and lead you to the best exit strategy should a situation require it. Deer can help us stay aligned with the purest, gentlest version of ourselves. 
So let's look at antlers. So normally only male deer will have antlers except amongst reindeer, which we've already looked at. Male deer grow antlers when reaching adulthood. Adolescent deer have antlers, but these are covered with a fuzzy material called velvet. So they will shed their antlers seasonally if living in temperate climates. And it is a belief of experts that antlers evolved from tusks that prehistoric herbivores used for foraging and defence. So cattle and goat horns are a dead appendage made from keratin, the same protein found in hair and nails. Antlers differ as they are alive, a fast growing form of bone that possesses blood vessels and active cells. So antlers have been used in rituals for at least 10,000 years. Antlered headdresses and rattles have been discovered from Mesolithic sites. They may also have been used in rites to call forward a favourable hunt. In Babylonian cosmology, the celestial stag is associated with the life-giving power of the sun. The antlered deer throughout mythology is portrayed as an elusive noble beast, sometimes able to shapeshift or a harbinger of great destiny. Antler's magical correspondences are masculine, solar, and representative of the earth and fire. They also connect to the annual death and resurrection of the sun due to deer shedding and regrowing their antlers. The antlered stag represents wisdom, nobility, protection and the cycle of death and rebirth. Many pagans consider the stag as representative of the horned god who gives his life to nourish the tribe who regenerates in springtime with velvet antlers. Yet despite antlers generally being considered as masculine, they still connect with the goddesses of wisdom and the hunt. The shape of an antler has a lunar curve as well as a solar ray like spread. When antlers are pictured with a full moon between the antlers, it is a powerful symbol of the dual nature of the divine, both male and female. The shape of the antlers symbolically links stags to the life-giving powers of the sun's rays. Antlers can be used in many ceremonial and magical ways. A traditional use is as ritual headgear, or placed upon your altar to link to the energy of the deer and its many associations and deities. Antlers have also been made into affirme handles, wands, staffs, runes and amulets. Antlers shed naturally, so can be found during the winter shed season, should you live in an area where deer roam free. However, there are certain regulations in certain locations in regards to just taking them. Also, there will be many people searching for antlers during this season as they are highly lucrative to many. If you have your own land, the antlers have been shed. It is said that you should only take what you need as antlers form a winter nutrient source for squirrels and other small mammals. You might prefer to try to find some in an antique shop or auction house, or you can even buy replica antlers. The deer is a great animal energy to work with magically. They can be considered a bridge between the wild and the tame, a link between this world and the next. That is all I have for you today, witches. So our next episode will link to more of her Welsh, Irish mythology, different association with many different deities, other deer goddesses, how you might want to work with her. We also have an initiation to work with her also. 
Just want to let you know on Thursday, 28th of September from 7.30 BST on Zoom, over on the Witches Institute on Patreon, we have our gathering where we will be discussing baneful witchcraft. I've just put a Patreon podcast episode out on this topic where we look at curses, hexes, jinxes, all manner of different aspects of baneful witchcraft. So if you wanted to join us for that, it is just £6 per month to sign up for Patreon, but you can cancel at any time. And with that, you get a Patreon podcast episode, Grimoire Sheets for the White Witch podcast. We also have Hedge Witch Studies, where we look at a power animal, herbs, trees, crystals, We have a folklore retelling, meditations. We have our book club, The Literary Witches Coven, our monthly gathering. There is all manner of witchy content, not to mention our witchy community over on Discord, a group of wonderful witches. So if you'd like to join us over there, you can find the details in the show notes. I will also link in the show notes different websites that I've referred to for the information for this podcast. Aside from that, witches, have a wonderful weekend. If you are catching this on Mabon and the days around it, have a wonderful Mabon, whatever you are up to. I'm very excited. I'm going to be off to a druid temple druid site, but I will fill you in on more of that on the next episode. But for now, I'm sending you lots and lots of witchy love.